Chapter 32, Musculoskeletal Trauma. Before we get going, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel so you get updates as we go. So let's get... Let's start off with a quick review of the musculoskeletal system. Based on the name, we know it includes muscles, joints, and bones, providing the framework, the bending, the movement, uh, ensuring that we are the people that we are. You have cartilage that provides the flexibility between the bones, uh, like your nose, your ears, cartilage between the ribs and the sternum. You've got ligaments that connect bones to bones, and you've got the tendons that connect the muscles to the bones. So all pieces come together to help us form the musculoskeletal system. What we're going to talk about next is how the different traumas uh, to that system cause problems for the patient and how we provide support to them. So we've got the uh, bones are uh, dense connective tissue. They're very uh, vascular. The bone marrow is what produces red blood cells. So we know there's blood flow through these bones. Uh, joints are where they connect together. So we've got joints throughout our body. The bones are pretty good about healing themselves. So when you break, they clot, they come together, they start rejuvenating. Sometimes it takes a surgical intervention where they uh, put some hardware in there to try to help stabilize the bones so that they can grow together uh, the way they should. But otherwise, uh, the body should heal itself. Muscles, we've got... Uh, Skeletal muscles, we've got smooth muscles, we've got cardiac muscles. The cartilage is that soft point between the bones that helps uh, maintain movement and a little flexibility. This is a little bit more detail on your tendons and your ligaments. As you see, tendons take the muscle, connect it to the bone. So that's the patellar tendon you see there in the picture, connecting the uh, quad to the patella. Then you've got the ACL and MCL and the lateral ligaments connecting bones to bones. So you've got them connecting the, the knee joint there. So general guidelines for our care to our patients. As always, we're going to start with the mechanism of injury. Try to figure out what caused it. Was it direct impact? Something hit the bone and caused the fracture or hit the body and caused the fracture. Was it a twist, twisting or rotational force? Did they step in a hole? Did they fall down? Did they twist their body and the foot didn't move? Uh, did they twist their arm and the, the body didn't move? What happened? Indirect force. If this person, your patient jumps off of a high uh, location, lands on their feet, but it fractures the head of the humerus or head, head of the femur, then that's an indirect force. The force was applied to the bottom of the feet, but once it was in motion, it traveled up the bones and caused a fracture of the femoral head. So a fracture is any break, whether it's open or closed. We've got a couple different types. Comminuted, bo uh, broken in several places. Then we've got a green stick, which is more likely from a uh, younger patient so you get incomplete the bone is still soft so it looks like a uh, like a branch off a tree that breaks but not completely all the way through then you've got your angulated fractures where you have an extra bend in the bone this is a uh, fracture of the a lower leg you can see it's pretty pretty obvious there what's going on if the injury is to the joint uh, it could be a dislocation where the two joint pieces come apart, that's usually associated with a tear of the ligaments. Uh, or if you just stretch or partially tear ligaments, it's called a sprain. And if you overexert the muscles or stretch the muscles, you get a strain. So we've got injuries to joints, we've got injuries to bones. Sometimes it's not that easy to see what's wrong unless you have x-ray vision. So we treat them all about the same. So like this says, not all injuries are confirmed in the field. If the bone is sticking out, you're pretty comfortable saying it's probably a fracture, uh, but you can't tell for sure until you get an x-ray. So we treat everything the same. We apply uh, a splint to it. We keep them immobilized. We make it sure they're in the right anatomical positions. The only ones we do want to move are as if there's a long bone that is shortened most likely the femur, sometimes the humerus. 
but the femur is the one we've, we're going to focus on now. So if you've got a femur fracture, the two bones will actually go side by side and shorten the length of the leg. And that will uh, require you to put a traction splint to pull everything back to normal length. When we put a splint on, whether it's a traction splint or a regular splint, we're putting the bones back in its normal place. And that hopefully reduces pain and other tissue damage. Maybe it'll slow the bleeding down too for us. So when we're doing our quick assessment, don't get caught looking at the musculoskeletal injury. Make sure you identify all the life-threatening injuries first and then treat the musculoskeletal as needed. Uh, the patient will survive a fracture unless it's a, uh, a major bone like a, a femur and then we want to get that splinted up right away into the trauma center so they can fix that problem. Uh, remove clothing, again make them trauma naked, that way you can see everything that you need to treat. If there's swelling around the area, you're going to put ice on it. Uh, it could be bleeding, could be swelling, so get some, uh, some ice on it, reduce the swelling as much as you can, that helps with pain. The problem if we get too much swelling is it pushes against the tissue and the blood vessels and you have uh, lack of blood flow or hypoperfusion to that area you get cellular damage and uh, you can actually bleed out uh, if you get too much blood so what you're going to find is pain or tenderness deformity or angulation it's going to be crooked grating or crepitus swelling bruising exposed bone ends joints that are locked in position and nerve and blood uh, blood vessel compromise so you'll have decreases in sensation and pulses distal to the injury point we're looking for the three or the six p's of your assessment so pain or pallor or pain or tenderness pallor parathesis pins and needles feeling they've got that uh, compromise of their nerve endings pulses are diminished or absent paralysis or they feel pressure in the extremity so you get your six p's Treatment wise, we're going to stay, take standard precautions, always, that's why they're called standard. Fl gloves, mask, uh, eye protection, do your primary assessment, do not forget that, don't get distracted by the injuries. Do your secondary assessment, if you have spinal issues, then that's where you would uh, apply the C-collar. If they are, uh, if you've got all the life-threatening injuries taken care of, you can put splints on the patient. We're going to talk about different types of splints, but no one stands at the door and holds up a score as you walk in based on the quality of your splint. It's either good at, that it immobilized what you needed it to, or bad you didn't. Uh, they don't care what it looks like. So we're going to uh, treat, uh, do most for splinting in route, unless it's a life-threatening issue, which might be, I uh, really can't think of anything that I'd splint on scene. If you have multiple body parts that need splinting, we have that one size fits all splint uh, in the uh, backboard. You strap them to the backboard and they've you've splinted everything in the body. If they have open wounds, make sure you cover those to prevent any uh, further contamination. What splinting does for us is it makes the joints and bones not move anymore. So it helps the patient with pain, it helps the patient with swelling, it prevents any further injuries to the uh, interior body parts, the nerves, the arteries, the vessels, the muscles. Hopefully it prevents a closed fracture from becoming an open fracture. Hopefully it prevents a partial amputation from becoming a full amputation. And it's supposed to uh, slow the blood loss, which helps us there. Sometimes we may need to realign an extremity. Uh, this is if uh, there's poor perfusion distal to the injury point. If you've got uh, low, no blood, uh, no pulse distal the uh, injury point. If the color is changing on the extremity, your service may allow you to realign the body parts. That's something we've we we've used here in our local system for a while. If you've got an injury that does not look like it's perfusing distal, you can apply gentle traction and try to realign it. 
if you meet resistance, you stop. So this shows a, an example. They're holding the elbow from the top and the bottom. She's going to try to realign it to get a pulse back in that elbow. The pain from realignments only momentary. Hopefully we get ALS there so they can help out uh, by some pain meds. If you can't get it to realign, splint it and notify the hospital that you're coming in with a, a patient that you, you're trying to realign and it didn't work. One EMT grabs above, one grabs low, and you gently pull apart and try to get to the right position. If you meet resistance, stop. All right, some different types of splints we're going to be working with. Uh, you've got the backboard or the rigid splints. You've got the vacuum splints you see in the uh, red. Then you've got traction splints on both sides of the uh, backboard and the saw, uh, vacuum splints. And then underneath the two traction splints, you've got a malleable splint. It's like a SAM splint, but there's, there's many brands on the market. Some strategies for splinting. Check your life threats. Make sure you do not skip a life threat. Just do a splint. Expose the site. Check for CSM. Do they have circulation, sensation, motor function? Document what you find and where you found it. Align everything back to anatomical position. If there's a bone sticking out, don't push it back in. That's bad. When you're splinting a joint, you want to immobilize the bone above and below it. If you're splinting a bone, you immobilize the joint above and below it. So you're going to have lots of options. Practice all the different types, whether you're, you've got vacuum splints, rigid splints, malleable splints, improvised splints. Pick all, look at all your options and pick the best one for your situation with your patient. If you can, splint them before you move them. That helps uh, keep the pain down. And then pad all your voids so there's no uh, hard spots on the patient that cause more problems for them. This is a term you'll hear multiple times, splinting the patient to death. It means that you forgot to check the life threats before you splinted. So you took the time to put a splint on when the patient was bleeding out from somewhere else. So you got to make sure ABCs are done, everything's good there, and then you can worry about splitting. You don't want to make the splint too tight, or you're going to cause a, a lack of circulation to the injured, injured body part. If you have it too loose, they're going to be moving around. So use some common sense, some judgment, and try to make it the best situation you can. Long bones, joint injuries, take standard precautions, expose it, manually stabilize it. A lot of times this can be done by the patient themselves. Hold this until I get the splint put on. Simple enough. So this one, you're, you're holding the splint or holding the joint. Try to get everything uh, aligned in a neutral position. USS CSM, sensation or circulation, sensation, motor function. If it's cyanotic or pulseless, you're going to try to realign it or at least get some perfusion to it. There's checking the distal pulse, sensation, motor function. Measure and adjust the splint. If you have any shortening of the extremity that you're going to put the splint on, you have an opposite side to measure it against. Get the splint made the right length before you worry about putting it on the injured body part. So measure it against the good side. Apply it, make sure it's secure, and then go back and check your CSM again. Make sure you leave the hand exposed, the fingers exposed, so you can check the CSM. And you notice on this splint they've got the uh, rolled up portion in the palm of the hand. Think about the normal anatomical position of the hand. It should be slightly curved, so that makes it more comfortable for them. So we, we typically have that in place so that they can uh, keep the hand in a normal function position. 
and go back and check your CSM. Make sure you've got good perfusion there. Traction splints. Like we said, your big bones like the humerus and the femur, they will actually uh, pull the, mu the muscles, will pull the bones side by side so it gets a shortening, and we want to pull everything back into the normal position. We have bipolar or unipolar uh, splints. Basically, do they have two poles, one on either side, or one pole on one side only? When you're applying traction, you're using 10% of the patient's body weight, not to exceed 15 pounds. Most of the time, we apply enough to get the limb to the same length as the original limb, and then that is adequate for you. So take your standard precautions, expose the leg, stabilize it with manual traction, check your CSM. Measure the splint to the right, to the uh, uninjured leg, to make sure you've got the right size for them. You apply the ankle hitch and pull manual traction on it. While you're using that manual traction, you lift up the leg and slide the traction device in the position and then you're going to apply the ischial strap. Once the ischial strap is, a, is secured around the upper thigh, then you attach the ankle hitch to the traction device and apply traction until you get relief of pain or the, the, the length of the leg is equal to the other leg and secure it to the backboard and to the patient. Once you're done, you go back as always and go to your CSM and get them on the backboard for transport. It makes it much easier. When you're shutting the back door of the ambulance, make sure your traction splint is not too far out towards the door because we don't want to hit it with the door as we close the door. Next up, let's talk about the shoulder girdle injuries. First, we have to do a patient assessment, making sure we know that there's something wrong with the shoulder. It's typically going to be uh, dropped. It's going to be one shoulder lower than the other. That's the indication there's an injury to that. Uh, it's either a fracture of the top of the humerus, fracture of the scapula, or the clavicle, something in that shoulder girdle there. Check your CSM, and it's pretty simple on this one. We put the arm in a sling, and then we use a swath to secure it in place and everything is good. You might want to put a uh, a pillow between the arm and the chest if you want to raise the arm up if that feels better. But again, with everything we do to the patient, we're going to ask them if it feels better. And if it doesn't, we adjust. Pelvic injuries. They're going to have first a mechanism that explains why they're having pain in the pelvis, hips, groin, or back. When you put pressure on the iliac crest, it causes severe pain. That is a fractured pelvis. They can't lift their legs. The, you've got lateral rotation of the foot. Pressure on the bladder because the bones are actually pushing against it. Maybe some interior, uh, internal bleeding that's coming out the urethra, rectum, or vaginal opening. Your treatment is keep the patient calm. Keep them relaxed. Check CSM. Put the legs in the normal anatomical position. Stabilize them. Because it takes a lot of force to uh, fracture the pelvis and the spine is hooked to the pelvis, you want to make sure there's no uh, spinal injuries. Reassess distal CSM and transport with uh, oxygen in place. Now there are uh, some options we have of a pelvic wrap. We have what's called the SAM sling, and there's a video of that in the supplemental uh, if uh, watch list for chapter five or modular five. You put this on patients who have a possible fractured pelvis. Remember, you need a lot of force to fracture a pelvis. So you don't want to just put these on everybody that has hip pain. That could be something else. We want to make sure there's a fractured pelvis when we put this on the patient. This is a commercial wrap. 
Uh, this is what you would see in the ER or a uh, recovery ward. This option is the sheet method. Think about if you're putting a patient on this backboard and you have to roll them back and forth, how much pain is that going to cause to the pelvis? So think about the other options we have to get them onto that board. So with a sheet, you draw it up on either side. Tied in place to pull the pelvis back together. Hip dislocation, it is, this is different from a pelvic fracture. Pelvic fracture is a fracture of the bone. Dislocation means the hip came out of the joint. So you got anterior posterior dislocations. If it's anterior, the foot's going to be towards, turned towards the inside. If it's a, ex, a uh, posterior dislocation, the foot's going to be towards the outside. Sometimes there's a, uh, a shortening of the leg based on how, how bad the dislocation is, but you, you, you're going to get it based on the mechanism. Do your CSM, put them on a backboard, put some uh, pillows around them. That'll help stabilize the leg and the hip as you drive to the hospital. Older patients are more susceptible to uh, hip fractures because of the osteoporosis. They can actually fracture a hip while they're walking and then just uh, fall to the ground. It wasn't the fall that caused the fracture, it was the actual uh, the, the osteoporosis. They're going to have localized pain, pressure on the greater trochanters, tissue is going to be discolored, lots of swelling, unable to move while laying on the back, unable to stand. The foot's going to be turned downward, and they're going to have injury, injured limb that looks shorter than the other because it's been displaced as it goes. Care. Put something between the legs and tie the legs together. Pretty simple uh, treatment-wise. Uh, you can use thin splints to push cravats or straps under the natural voids. And then you wrap wrap it up to, amongst, uh, to leg to leg. Here shows what it looks like when we do it. You've got something between their legs to give them that extra support and some binders around to hold the legs together to reduce the pain in the, of the movement. Femoral shaft. Possible open fracture. This takes a lot of energy to fracture too, more like a, a motorcycle hit or a, a crash, auto pedestrian, bicycle crash. Stop the bleeding, treat for shock. If they have a open fracture, the bone is out. We do not apply the traction splint. We only apply traction, traction if the bone is interior. And then once you're done applying it, put the C, uh, check the CSM and document that again. They do make pediatric size traction splints. If you're doing a pediatric patient, you want to make sure you're using the right size splint. The only precaution I would say with a pediatric uh, traction splint it better be done in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. If you ha your patient suffered enough force to cause a fracture of the femur, there's probably other things wrong with them, and you need to get them to the hospital. So do the traction splint in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Knee injuries, pain, tenderness, swelling, deformities. Something's wrong with the knee. You can't tell whether it's dislocated, a torn ligament, torn meniscus. You're not sure, assess CSM, immobilize it the way it is, and then assess CSM again. Immobilizing the knee can be done multiple ways. And we'll, in class, we'll play with a couple different options there for you. Tip fib, pain, tenderness, swelling. You see in a common theme here, possible deformity. Uh, apply the vacuum splint, air inflated splint, two padded boards. Uh, you use a figure eight system around the ankle. There's lots of options to mobilize the lower extremity. I like one board on either side from the knee to the ankle. Depends on, and there's also the option of a pillow. It's up to you. 
your assessment, you're going to have pain, swelling, deformity for the feet. Assess CSM, stabilize it, place your cravat under the ankle, tie the pillow to the ankle. I like a pillow splint for a foot injury. Just wrap it up, keep it in normal anatomical position. So if you normally have your feet sticking up, the toe would be pointing upwards. So what we show here, that's the basic pillow splint. And you notice they've got the toes hanging out, so you can check your CSM. Put the cravat on the ankle of the foot. Use that to create a figure eight around the ankle so that you can get some support to keep the foot in a normal anatomical position, pointing up. Check for shock, apply cold packs as needed. Wrist and hand injuries, very similar to what we're doing with the legs. You're gonna have deformity and tenderness, maybe dislocated fingers, splint them the way you find them. Wrap a finger to a finger, Wrap a uh, body part around uh, the splints. Try to take care of your patient here to keep it from moving around. There's a single finger splint. Don't know how many people carry popsicle sticks in the ambulance, but you may want to keep an ice cream man around so you can make some for yourself. So as always, if you have questions, write them down, bring them to class, email me. We'll get the answers for you. Thanks and have a great night.